Good evening and welcome to Black Atlantic. Uh, I'm Clinton and this is Hillary and uh, we are really happy to be on the air tonight uh, for Black History Month and a special presentation with Rogers TV. Definitely happy to be a part of this tonight. Uh, we are a podcast and media channel with the goal of bringing East Coast voices to the world. Yes, um, I would say that we've, we've existed now for exactly one year. This, is, this month is our one year anniversary. Um, we're very proud of all of the work that we've gotten to do as, uh, I would say more than a podcast. We've been able to really engage the community, volunteer with the New Brunswick Anglophone English Department in building a Black Histories curriculum, opportunities with CBC, other community members, like Rogers TV, which is really, really exciting and a, a new foray for us, although we have been working on making the podcast more visual this year. So please check us out on YouTube, Anch anything streamed through Anchor, so Spotify, Amazon, Apple, um, all of those streaming platforms. We have a GoFundMe page, a Twitter, a LinkedIn, a TikTok with 13,000 followers, Facebook, I feel like that's all of the <laughs> anything, that's much it. anything social media, we have it. And please give us a follow over there. Yeah, type in Black Atlantic on your search engine and you'll find us. Um, every week, again, we interview guests or talk about different topics that apply to people. And uh, it's a way that we've been learning a lot as well. Every time we interview someone, we learn something new about ourselves, about uh, this amazing Atlantic provinces that we live in and everything like that. Uh, we have a special guest with us today, Alon McCall. <laughs> Uh, who will be contributing to the episode and we'll also be talking to him about some of the history we've uncovered through uh, our contact Meredith Batt at the Historical Archives of New Brunswick yeah. and uh, you know <sighs> black history is Canadian history uh, and a lot of Canadians in school they, they grew up and they didn't really learn about Canadian history. We have the typical thing that everyone talks about is uh, Martin Luther King, an amazing man, uh, and Rosa Parks, the woman who helped spark the civil rights movement. But uh, when it comes to Canadian history, there's, there's lot of, not a lot that uh, is, has been educated over the years. And so we thought no better way than, than to talk about <laughs> Canadian history than to invite an American on. Um, not only because we do really want to tie this into how Americanized our history is, but as we've uncovered history, we know that you've, you know, you've made a whole life here over the last 20 years. You, you are a dad, and so we'll get you to do your introduction, but also we wanted to share these things and see how they've impacted you, how this knowledge impacts your view of New Brunswick and sort of any you know um, ways that there's connections between the two places but also things that are widely wildly different because right. I think everybody looks to America America for black history Absolutely. and then sees Canada as just a a, a, very, a white place or the a very friendly neutral place exactly exactly yeah. so Alon why don't you tell everybody watching uh, all about you <laughs> awesome well thanks for having me uh, on here it, we go way back so it's so uh, this is <laughs> nice it's it's amongst friends uh, my name is Alon McCall uh, moved here uh, from New York City about 21 years ago um, I have a son uh, who I raised here in Moncton uh, he's now in university in Ontario um, I have a young daughter um, I have a band called Echo 7 uh, I run a business called uh, Black Ice Basic Lawn Care. Um, I've done many jobs here in the Maritimes over the past 20 years. I've had the chance to um, start a recording studio, the Wii Music Studios, um, and start a couple businesses. So um, I feel like I'm pretty versed in, in maritime life right now. So, so yeah, that's a little bit about me and who I am and, and what, I, what I do, I guess. Amazing. I want to, I guess, start by asking you, like, you've already sort of touched on it, but in terms of that, you know, Canadian Americanizing mm -hmm. black history just in the about 20 years that you've been here in, in terms of Canadian history that you've learned and we spent some time on a separate podcast together and I've interviewed you and obviously mm -hmm. and we have together as well and right. we've shared some of our knowledge with you that we've have had the privilege to learn as podcast right. hosts but how do you perceive the black Canadian history the New Brunswick black history from the, the an outside lens perspective it, it's very I hate to use the term whitewashed, but it's very, it's very neutral. It's very translucent. It, it, it's, it's very much a kind of very candy-coated, easy-to-swallow history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the U.S. has its problems, and, and we all know that. But one thing about the U.S. is that the history is the history. And, you know, as we learn more, you know, it, it, no matter how gritty or how aggressive it is, it is what it is. Where I find, you know, here in Canada, even with Canadian black history, it's just very much kind of a glossed over kind of history where we know something happened, but 
in the end, we're still Canadian and everyone's, you know, friendly and we all smile and, and, and all that. So I, I, I would definitely say there is a, a bit less bite to the history here mm -hmm. in Canada, which is unfortunate because certain things need to have that edge in order for it to have an impact and a personal impact. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be the difference that I would definitely say between the states and, and Canadian history and the, the delivery of it for sure. Absolutely. There's been a lot of erasure in Canadian history though, right? Uh, we oh, yeah. all grew up uh, in Canada believing that we were the saviors, that we were the ones who, uh, you know, uh, helped with the Underground Railroad, who, who rescued black people from right. American oppression and, and slavery. Uh, but the truth is that we have a bit of a dark history ourselves. Uh, Absolutely. There was uh, hundreds of years of, of slavery in Canada, and it's, uh, you know, it's harder to get into Canadian black history because uh, there are the black Canadians that have been here for hundreds mm -hmm. of years and then so much immigration that has taken mm -hmm. place over the years as well, especially in New Brunswick. Absolutely. Um, black people in New Brunswick that have been here from the late 1700s, they tended to start off in, uh, in St. John and, and moved out from there and there's still a rich history of people that, that live there. Um, in a place like Moncton where we are now, um, the history of black people is a little, it doesn't go back as far. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that there's a lot of black people that came from West Africa uh, to the schools. Uh, it used to be that they would come to the schools, go back to Africa afterwards, or move to Toronto or Montreal. Now a lot more of them are staying. And there's been a lot of immigration as well. Like you from the States, me from Toronto, I've been here for 13 years now. And uh, it's just black people are from so many different countries mm -hmm. here in New Brunswick. But we all get categorized under this umbrella of blackness. But uh, it's, it's, the heritage is, is diverse and yet it's, it's been sort of suppressed. Absolutely. Um, speaking of the, the history of sort of all of the various black people in Brunswick, so I'll, I'll start off this little tidbit of history that we, fa we found that I, I personally found super compelling. I um, mean, it's specifically about um, St. John. I believe it would now be the area of Elm Hill, but essentially back in the day, so slavery was abolished in New Brunswick in 1833. So if anybody watching did not think that slavery was a thing here, it totally was, unfortunately. Um, and actually there was a Negro school, one of several, um, but this one was called Otnabog School. There was another one in Woodstock as well. Um, and essentially the history of the school is it opened in 1820 and um, at first in, in 1846 there were 25 female students and 11 male students um, and then at one point um, a person who came actually from North Carolina um, for a conference went by and noticed that the, the black female assistant teacher was not licensed and her moral conduct was not good and that these kids were actually being taught poorly by another black person. Um, not long after, in November 11th, 1908, a teacher who had taught there since 1873 passed away. His wife and daughter wanted to keep the school running uh, for the 25 uh, students that were still there. They were looking for a license to do so. And then over the course of the next seven years, there are uh, several letters documented, as we said, from the provincial archives, um, essentially arguing over, is anyone ever going to teach these kids again? So shortly after the, the wife and the daughter are unable to continue teaching for three years, there is no one teaching like 40 black kids. They just get no education at all. Um, and the premier keeps writing letters to the superintendent saying like, this is a problem. A bunch of black people in the community keep saying like, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. These these black children now have no literary competency. So how do you expect them to ever make money, ever have jobs? And we know how that story right. ends up going, but sure enough, these 40 students have no education. There's a lot of back and forth about um, not allowing any white teachers to move into the black community and then no white teachers being willing to teach from a distance and then they discuss a few black people that would they would consider allowing a local license and then communication drops off and from what I understand the school just simply ceased to exist and well, what happened to the kids what happens to the kids is based on what I've learned from other research and as we know the moral of the story those are the kids who are the starters of poor families who do not right. get job opportunities who become impoverished and have a harder time um, growing right. up learning about the New Brunswick Association for um, 
The New Brunswick Association, what's the rest of the acronym? Uh, the NBAACP. CP, the NBAACP, yeah. Advancement of Colored People, that's mm -hmm. the rest of the acronym. Um, they, uh, they basically outlined for the community of St. John how these people were so poor they turned to substance use and drug use, they had no proper housing, and I think it's wild that we're still talking like that now. Absolutely. This is happening in 1913 and then that uh, the NBAACP is in the 1970s mm -hmm. and we are here today with like Manju Varma's Commissioner of Systemic Racism report still saying the same things. Um, just out of curiosity hearing about this happening in St. John knowing that you're you know putting your kids through school and seeing the way the yeah. community is now and having seen disenfranchised black people probably in America and probably in here as well talking about this whitewashing of history, right. do you find this surprising? Absolutely not. I think anyone who dares to believe that the hub city, Moncton, yeah. and the surrounding cities, so St. John yes. and such, um, did not play a part in, in the slave trade or in the, in, in, in the degradation of, of, of black people is just kind of fantical in a way. There's no way that you're gonna have a city that is, is engaging in commerce at that time via the water and via train and having people coming from the states up, up, up north um, that there wasn't that influence mm -hmm. spreading over in, into here. To hear that about the schools is no surprise at all. And I mean, the sad thing is, is that a very slight form of that is still here in the school system, I feel today. You know, if you're not teaching students properly in the proper history and giving them the proper education, um, if you're also expecting um, children who are immigrating here to behave a certain way or to fall in line with certain with certain you know predetermined behaviors um, and not being you know open to their culture, being willing to learn as an educator how to teach and, and, and how to navigate those waters, you're basically doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like yes, you may be giving them a textbook still now and you still allow them in your schools and you have a person standing in class teaching them, but if you're not teaching them anything that's going to help them, um, to, to teach them about the reality of where they are, um, to teach them real history and, you know, and, and to give them the information they need to move forward, then you're kind of doing the same thing. You're yeah. basically leaving them out in the woods and in the, in, in the waters to fend for themselves. Yep. Um, and I know when my son was in school, you know, there was very little black history like you mentioned earlier. It's you know, the, 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 two, the two token <laughs> issues that you yes. wanna kind of you know, raise during that 28 day period of February. Right. Um, and, and no one ever goes any deeper than that. Um, and I just feel that, you know, educators, if you really are serious about educating children and you care and say you have a heart for children, then you really need to expand your mind, expand your knowledge uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and dig deeper and, 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 you know, start bringing up the tough topics. You know, no one's saying go greatly, gravely in depth, mm -hmm. but there are other stories to be yeah. told during black history. And I think the other thing too is, you know, I would love educators to stop talking about the negative. Everyone talks about slavery and, you know, black people being in chains and, and, and you know, there are so many, I mean, a plethora of accomplishments that colored people, <laughs> black people, immigrants have donated, not donated, but have contributed to North America in technology, sciences, mm -hmm. every aspect of our daily lives. You know, I would love to, to, to see, you know, more of that as well. Let's have a balance of the two. Yes, we have the atrocities, but let's also talk about the successes. Um, so that's what I would, would love to, you know, that's so no. A long yeah. answer to your short question is that no, um, I'm not surprised. And I wanna add briefly too in the research, what, the one thing that I also found astounding briefly is just that um, in all of the letters back and forth, I found it interesting that the premier was sort of advocating for the black people while also there was still always this weird pullback. Right. But in, in, in other um, articles, I found that despite them saying that there were no competent black teachers, two black people graduated from a teaching degree with honors at UNB and were told that they had no job opportunities, so they ended up moving to Nova Scotia and America while these 40 kids are desperate to be educated right. just to be able to read. That I found saddening, not shocking and just a weird it's so weird that it's still happening it's still that's happening. just like the maritimes yeah. misappropriating resources they <laughs> yeah. still do that to this day that, that's not a shock, <laughs> not a shock. sorry 
<laughs> no, don't be sorry. <laughs> Speaking to what you're saying, I mean, you, you couldn't be more right. You do have to balance the realities of history that's been erased because it does explain things like generational wealth gaps Absolutely. and poverty and the idea that it's not always so easy for everyone to just, you know, quote unquote, pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Uh, and this person did it, why can't they? They've had the same amount of time here in, in a province or a country. Um, it gets a bit more complicated than Absolutely. that. But speaking to the idea of you wanting to see more black joy, more black accomplishment, uh, more mm -hmm. about the diaspora, um, we couldn't agree more. Um, you know, Hillary and I have been working for the past two years um, with actually <laughs> the New Brunswick Conservative yeah. government um, <coughs> with an amazing woman named Kate Charette to try to implement things like that into New Brunswick education. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to help form a, a new curriculum that teachers can reference to teach kids more about black accomplishment, uh, black people and their contributions in, in, to, in law, in politics, science and innovation. Right. Uh, the, the history, the rich history of Africa before the transatlantic slave trade mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so it's a slow and arduous journey, but um, you're right. It, it yeah. shouldn't always be about black pain and black suffering and black sorrow. But at the same time, uh, it's certainly important to not pretend that that kind of stuff didn't happen here and that it's not affecting people uh, here today. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I think that carries over for, for all people and all, you know, all people of all color. I think that when you speak the negative to someone who is not of color, it still creates a negative connotation, right? You have to have the positive. Like if you're if you're looking to you know to 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 combat racism and, and get everything on on an uptick and, and for everyone to start seeing everyone as equals and, and everything like that you have to start preaching those positives to people who are not of color. They need to see people of color as successful, yeah. as smart, as innovative, as you know people who are progressive, right? Because that will change how they interact. Well, yeah, right? be because you're always you're sort of always telling people that one to pity black people right. then that comes into the play of the black card right like oh i i need to be nice to them as as like reparations not exactly. because they're a human being who just deserves basic level respect right. but because we wronged them once and that's where we get this weird power play in this dichotomy of right. like oh, I, I shouldn't have to owe them anything right. this or that instead of just being like these people were are just as competent this is an unfortunate thing right. that happened but let's move past the depression and the trauma right. and just say that like they they suffered they were resilient they rose up and they are your lawyers your doctors your nurses right. they're your uh, everywhere at this exactly. point and you should just respect them because they're human beings right and it also stops the assumptions that oh well you're brown so therefore you must have come from x background yeah which is not always the case well right? no like so there's not even slavery in my family i just happen to have a permanent tan no one has to be sad for me <laughs> like it's okay guys facts there you facts. go yeah there you go so so do you think that then you're saying that through focusing on, you know, the things that we've tried to be focusing on through New Brunswick education, that that will help break down barriers, negative biases, negative stereotypes? Because New Brunswick has always been a, a really a homogenous uh, province without exposure to other cultures at all. Like the only exposure they had to black people was like rap music and what you'd see on cops. <laughs> so Let's Absolutely. not go there. Let's not go there. Well, I mean, yeah. I could so tell you stories for days about that nonsense. So do you think, um, sh like I'm curious, do you think showing the joy and the achievements will break down negative biases or do you think it'll... Oh no, I, it's like with any other, um, anything else. If you constantly promote the negative, that is what people see, that is how people approach situations, that's how people approach people. If you're going to go ahead and mention the accomplishments of individuals, then that changes your perspective, right? So when you see someone or meet someone of that race, you are not thinking negatively. Like, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, the, the whole, you know, feed the children thing, which I, you know, which is just pure, just propaganda and nonsense. So when you have constantly putting images of hungry, starving children oh, in front of people, yeah, it's yeah. like, okay, so when, children, right, yeah. so when you finally meet a person from that end of the world, the first thing that jumps in your mind is the feed the children commercial, which is sad and oh. should not be, but that's, that's the reality, right? So if you are not constantly being bombarded with the negative, and you're being told some of the positive, it will change how you approach people, it'll change how you speak to people, it'll change how you treat people, and you will not, you know, feel so, like Hillary said, either entitled or like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm doing my good deed for the day. 
because I chose to treat this person with respect. It'll become a natural reflex. So yes, I do feel that education in that way, not so yeah. much being like, yes, we all know slavery, that, that slavery was wrong, that racism is wrong, but I think the, the way to, to do it with children and education is to start teaching that, hey, you know what? Black and brown people have contributed just as much to yeah. our society, to the forward progress of, of, of humanity, to inventions, to creativity, to art, yeah. and to music as anyone else has. That's a good point because yeah. uh, a lot of people who have seen those uh, like Feed the Children videos, they believe that Africa is full of is nothing that, whole but starving it's children exactly. in desolate conditions when Africa is a rich and diverse yeah. continent of 54 countries exactly. with big cities and strong economies. But it's the same way as people in other countries watch 90210 and reruns and swear that the United States is Rodeo Drive. It's, yeah. the, it's the same uh, propaganda, yeah. right? Absolutely. So that's, you know... And a, and a lot of it too is obviously the, these organizations and charities mm -hmm. want to be able to continue to exist and make course, money and it's, it is somewhat self-serving and it is not always valid and often when you go to those places it's not the case at all or mm -hmm. it's you know somehow misconstrued but absolutely yeah. we've met so many people who that is they it, it's so so stereotypical and we so many guests on our show have said these things that they've come here and people ask them if because they're black they, they the cold affects them differently about hair all of these what we try to no longer say microaggressions but that is what becomes regular thought here is that it's huts it's desolute there's flies on their eyes everyone has malaria and it's just sad and that's not the case especially if you think about like so so many countries but the first one comes to mind is nigeria which we've talked about it is such a rich in culture and yeah. has money and you know right. it, it is prospering so well i think i think that's the good thing about what we try to do with Black Atlantic Media. Uh, every week when we, we've interviewed politicians, lawyers, doctors, um, business owners and stuff like that, including yourself. You were on our show in season one. And uh, I guess part of what we do is to, again, break down the impression that people may have here in New Brunswick that black people are all one thing or that we are not diverse and we don't have a number of diverse different opinions and uh, backgrounds and, and foods and musics and tastes. And you, we, can have, we can have black conservatives and we can have yeah. people with a varying amount of um, opinions. So yeah, that's a really strong point. I think so too, and I think, and we we talked about this like a little bit earlier today. But I do think that the like one of the good things about our show is that it teaches that a lot of the black people what they go through. I think in this country, the thorough thread is racism. It is that one struggle versus what I was saying earlier today is that I think that a lot of black Americans have gone through more of slavery together, that loss of identity, and so they've come together, and I do feel that like black Americans have a stronger bond, yes. whereas black Canadians were sort of spread all over trying to preserve whatever culture we came here with, however mm -hmm. we came here with, and we don't all necessarily gel and meld together, but the one thing we all experience is this sort of blatant ignorance and misunderstanding of who we are and where we came from because of this erasure of history and whitewashing and trying to like a sort of assimilate black people as if they are one where here they are not one at all right. absolutely i have a i have a question sure uh, and again it, it's a great reason why we have you on the show um you are tired of hearing about uh black struggles in history and the horrible things and the trauma that black people in america faced um but it's also been very heavily focused on in america mm -hmm. Like, how do you reconcile that with the fact that in Canada, um, a lot of that stuff has been erased and it has been tried to be suppressed? I mean, there were there was Ku Klux Klan members in New Brunswick um, less than 100 years ago. Um, there was people bought and sold as slaves in New Brunswick. And you have a lot of deniers. You have a lot of deniers in this province who say that, you know, there isn't racism. Slavery never happened. Like, what are you talking about? The Ku Klux Klan, that's an American thing. Should we not focus on that at all? No, we sh it should be known. And I think that this whole um, thing that happens in Canada, I feel, of trying to preserve a, a national identity is part of the issue. I think, you know, the states, because you have, you know, the 50 states and everyone kind of does their own thing, in a way, um, everyone's identity, you know, is, is, is individual. And so therefore you get those individual stories. Where I feel like yeah. Canada, for whatever its reason, whether, you know, it's arts or politics or whatever, there's like this national you know, common thread and theme that's mm -hmm. supposed to be spread that, no, in Canada, this didn't happen. And, and you know, okay. no one says anything else. Um, so I think, I, I just really wish that Canada would kind of just 
grasp the concept and, and the reality that these things, it happens. Just own it. Yeah, it doesn't okay. make you yeah. any less yeah. of who you are on the world stage. Um, just own the fact that, you know what, we played a part. This did happen. We're sorry. Make your amends and let's move on. Um, and I think Canada could be a lot stronger of a country and a society if we did that, if we actually saw people for who they were, their history, and, you know, and moved forward with that a, a, as one nation. Fair. I agree. I agree. I think that Canada is getting a lot better at it in terms of the indigenous community and the indigenous people. But I think that that has also that spotlight is amazing, but it has put uh, black people a bit in the shadow because we are still perpetuating the Underground Railroad. We were perfect to the black people. It's the marketing we received. Yeah, like we absolutely. grew up in Canadian schools and we were taught that we were the that heroes. And it. apparently, <laughs> mom, <laughs> apparently mom. we weren't. Yeah, the, yeah. the brutal reality. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, Alon, I would like to give you some, some air time to say if anyone is oh. looking to connect with you for lawn care, for music stuff, to book a show, to ask you oh your opinion goodness. on black histories and bother you some more, <laughs> where, would, where would they find you? And also, thank you so much for coming on and being oh. our sort of resident American expert. Yeah, no, listen, <laughs> thank you. I, I, I love the opportunity. It's good to see you guys again. Um, you can find uh, me on Instagram or on Facebook at Alon McCall. You can find my band, Echo 7 on Instagram, Twitter, uh, everywhere at underscore Echo7. Um, Black Ice Basic Lawn Care on Facebook. You can yeah. find us there and send Black us a message. Ice. Long face. Yes, Black, Black Ice Basic ice. Lawn Care. And I did yes. ask if it was like a tongue in cheek because ice, but lawn care. Yes. Yeah. Proceed. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's, that, that's, that's basically it. You can find me on social media or anywhere you want or, or just reach out to these two individuals. I'm sure they can put you in touch with Amazing. Them as well. Uh, well, to the watchers on Rogers TV, I, this has been a sneak peek once again about what we do every week. Uh, my name is Clinton Davis, and this is Hillary LeBlanc, and we are Black Atlantic, a weekly podcast that uh, talks about the experience of being black in Atlantic Canada. Thank you so much to Rogers TV for yeah. allowing us this time to show a different sort of scope of viewers what we do. And Hillary, do you want to let everyone know? Again, where they can find us? Yes, yeah, so LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon, Apple, anywhere, really just Google us. And also a big thank you to Meredith Bat, a long time from a friend of mine, for helping us uh, get this content uh, through Archives New Brunswick, which anyone can use as a resource. So feel free to also look up all of these tidbits or email us at blacklanic at gmail.com. And thank you to Jeff Boudreau, the producer uh, yeah. of this episode. And uh, if you do find us, please like, comment, subscribe, share. Happy Black History Month. Thank you.